start recording. All right, so audio is good, video is good, we are recording. So after I did all the grading, you know, I send you the uh, your scan file. I send you the um, the solution, the key, right? So you you can actually compare your answer to the correct answer. Um, and today I send you the grade. If you want an explanation, I can write a script because I actually commented on every single one of those points. And you know, basically, <clears throat> if you want to know exactly where the points are deducted, you know, I can give you a full explanation of that as well. So anyway, um, this is the combined. Okay, I probably should start with this graph here. So this graph shows you the. Um, if I were to sort the grades and get the score of exam one from low to high, and each tick you know, on the horizontal line represents a student, that's the distribution. So it's a full spectrum distribution, which is not normal for a usual class, you know, because they start 60% as, as, as a D, right? But this class does not do that. So I got one person who did not take the exam, hence the zero. And the next score is somewhere here. I would say that's about a 0.3-ish you know, out of four. And after adjustment, I also got one person getting exactly a you know 100%, and then one, two, three, four people who are getting more than 100%. But you can also see the distribution is kind of weird, okay? <clears throat> because you can see there are a few people getting really, really close to like a perfect score, and then a very sharp you know, change here, which means there are very few people in between. And then we get a really kind of flat curve you know, around here, and then we got you know, the tapering off you know, on the other end. So you know, it's, this actually looks normal for my classes. I don't know, understand, I never really understand why there's a little blip you know, at about one third of the class over here. But it's actually fairly normal for my classes. Yep. Because I took the sixth highest score and turned that into 100%. I think it's the fifth or the sixth. I cannot remember which one. <clears throat> so I rescaled the whole class based on that. Yep. Which plateau? Right below three, yeah. here. Okay, so that's in the uh, syllabus. Do you remember in the syllabus? These are GPAs. This is easy to understand because you have the numbers over here. That's your GPA equivalence. So at four is an A, three is a B, and so on. So does that answer your question? Okay. So anyway, uh, this is the distribution. Now I show you the distribution because you know with this graph, okay, you can actually tell where you are in the class. You can kind of know your ranking you know, amongst your peers in the class, and that may be useful information, okay? May or may not be useful information, especially when the class distributes over from zero all the way to four point something, you know, in this class. Um, I also put in like three links over here. Uh, this link here, let me show you what it is. <clears throat> it shows you statistics. Um, this one was eh, a little bit dated, but not too bad, okay? This was uh, updated December 24th last year. So it was what, three month-ish year ago. And it shows you know, that computer science and IT jobs expected to have a growth of 12% with an unemployment of 7.8%, which is very, very unusual. In other words, we are looking at a um, type of job market that is high growth, which you would expect to have very, very low unemployment because you know, the employers are going like, okay, we can take on anyone you know, who can get a job done, so you would expect a very low unemployment rate. And yet, the 7.8 unemployment rate, rate is higher than average. So why do you, do you think that is the case? 
I'm just going to post a question, okay? I don't have the answer. I have some speculations, and I can theorize you know, certain things, but I'm not going to share that, okay? I'll leave it to you to kind of think about that. Why does it have a high un unemployment rate when the growth is also really high? The article actually explains some of that too. So this is one article that is linked, and then this is the other one. So let me show you what that looks like. It makes use of the data from the first one. Why do tech companies not hire recent computer science graduates? So it basically starts with the statistics from the first article that I so showed you. And this one includes a lot of words and explanation of why that is the case. Um, you know, it talks about outdated curriculum and so on. You know, outdated curriculum basic means, basically means I'm not Okay, I shouldn't say I, but you know, as faculty, as a institution, we are not teaching you what you need for the job. Well, I don't think that is a very significant reason, because all UCs and all CSUs and basically all universities of the entire country have about the same curriculum. Okay, so I think that alone does not really explain anything. Uh, lack of right tech skills and so on, fast evolution of technology. This is one kind of important thing because AI did not exist or the chat GPT technology did not exist um, before the end of 2022. It was relatively recent, okay? It's not, it's, it's not like the, we have had that technology for a long time. Uh, no real-time experience. Mm. This means, you know, internship is important, okay, which kind of makes another announcement kind of important. I'll go back to that one in just a little bit. Access to ready-made IT talent from outsourcing. That used to be a kind of big thing, but I think it's not as big as it used to be. Um, foreign workers on, you know, various types of visas um, and so on. So you can kind of read this article too. You know, I think it might be helpful. Um, to at least get a view of, you know, what some other people, how other, some other people interpret the job market and, you know, how you can make yourself more marketable when you graduate. All right. And, of course, you know, this is the, the comment from uh, Jensen Huang. Um, it is a Reddit, so take it with a grain of salt, okay? But the more entertaining part is the conversation between, you know, the readers of uh, Reddit. Um, you know, because I think it's kind of interesting to you know, kind of read what other people have to say about it. Um, it's a very active you know, uh, thread, so you can probably go through this and you know, just kind of see what you take it with a grain of salt, okay? But at least you know, understand what other, how other people are seeing this situation. All right. Any comments, any feedback before we move on? Um, if you want to, <laughs> because you have the scanned copy already, but I can give you the uh, physical one too. Any other questions? No other questions? All right. So what does NVIDIA do? Because that one does relate to this class, believe it or not. They make GPUs, right, exactly. So how does that have anything to do with this class? How do you make a GPU? What does a GPU do? What does GPU stand for? Graphical processor unit, okay? And what does it do then? Okay, it does a lot of calculations, okay, computations in general. So that means, you know, they would do calculations like addition, subtraction, comparison, all the stuff that you have learned, right? Um, it needs to represent values inside, okay? 
And the interesting thing is they don't really necessarily use floating point numbers because floating point numbers is very cumbersome. You know, in or if you want to add two floating point numbers, it's not easy because they may have they may have different exponents. So the first thing you need to do is to line up the exponents before you can do even the basic addition. So it's actually not that user friendly or it, it's so a lot of times, you know, industry, you know, like GPUs, they make use of fixed points. In other words, your 64-bit unsigned integer has an implied point somewhere, okay? So it's the software that basically says, okay, let's just you know, go ahead and put this point right here between bit, you know, I'm just using an example here, between bit 20 and bit 21. So then all the calculations is based on that assumption, but the, you don't have an exponent of two that is variable anymore. And that makes computation, in especially addition, subtraction, and comparison a whole lot more efficient compared to floating point number calculations. So, um, but the, the bottom line is each GPU core is basically a processor. It has an adder, it has a subtractor, it has instructions to execute, which is basically all the things that we talked about in this class. Which also means, you know, if you want to be hired by, you know, NVIDIA or a competitor of NVIDIA, or if you want to program, you know, NVIDIA chips, you know, for AI applications, it is really helpful to understand the material, the content of this class. Is that kind of making sense? Okay. So this is really kind of weird because for many years, people look at this class and go like, why do we have to take this class? It doesn't make sense. Nobody is going to program in assembly anymore. And I don't really care about what is inside the processor because you know, I'm a programmer, right? You know, I don't need to know what is inside the processor. But if you want to make the best use of the resources, you actually do have to understand what is inside the processor. And why do we want to make the best use, the most efficient use of the resources inside the processor? <clears throat> okay, runtime, okay, and? Yes, okay, those are all very good reasons, but there's one additional reason that is the reason why we want to make the most efficient use of processing resources. Go ahead. We're running out of processing power. That is actually true, but we are also running out of cooling capability. The data centers are not limited by power supply. You can, you can have you know, a, a power plant you know, right next to the data center to give it all the power that it needs. The problem is extracting the heat. So why do you think there's heat? Okay, so let's say you just bought a new you know, computer and it had, comes with a um, new AMD processor, and it is rated at, say, 200 watts, okay? Just the processor itself is rated at 200 watts. What do you think those 200 watts are converted into? What is the form of that energy? In physics, there's conservation of energy, right? So if your power meter says, you know, the, the computer is consuming 200 watts, those 200 watts has to be converted into some other forms of energy. It can be sound, can be motion, can be so on and so forth. What do you think those 200 watts are converted into? Heat, exactly. So basically, when you have a computer that is a, let's say a 1,000 watt computer, like a gaming computer, those 1,000 watts are basically almost all converted into heat. So when you have a data center and you have a high concentration of processing you know, uh, hardware, then the heat extraction becomes the biggest problem. So how do you get the most processing done but emitting the least amount of heat? Sorry? Well, I'm talking about you know what you can do as a software engineer, as a programmer, as someone who writes the code. And it's just like writing the code that takes less processing power, more efficient code. More efficient code, exactly. But how do you write more efficient code? I'm gonna write everything in Java. Would that help? 
No, because Java burns resources like there's no tomorrow. Yes, go ahead. That's exactly right, okay? You know, so what you need to do is to figure out you know, what resources are available on the processor itself. What can occur concurrently? And you know, so you want to schedule those you know, operations to be done in parallel whenever they can be in parallel. You don't want to leave things idling and just you know, consuming power doing no actual useful computation. So how do you get that? Does, do you think C or C++ or Java or Python or JavaScript has language feature that can tell you, oh, this is, use this and we'll be optimizing you know, the use of hardware? They don't do that, okay? So that means you know, when you get down to the GPU level, which is parallel processing, you as the coder really have to have a good understanding of what kind of resources is available to you and then you make the best out of the resources that is available to you. So I think um, this class is becoming important again, okay, after decades of people saying, we got compilers, okay, we got Java, and so on and so forth. We don't need to understand low-level programming anymore. I think we are getting back to the you know, ages where you know, knowing how to make the most use of low-level hardware is going to become is going to become important again. So, just kind of interesting stuff, you know, that I think is happening. So there we go. All right. So before I switch to the, today's lecture, do you, are there any additional questions, comments, feedback? Yep. Go ahead. Uh huh. Yes, that's total points so far in percentage. Okay. So this one is in percentage of your overall score based on all the lab and homework assignments that I have graded as well as exam one. Okay. And using the scale of all the 20, uh, it will assign equal, you know, 50% to the homework assignment and 50% to exam one because in reality, they are 20% and 20%. So. That's why you know, the, the percentage is based on that. All right, so these graphs are not really meant for you to kind of guesstimate what kind of final grade you're gonna get. It is really meant for you to understand where you stand in the class you know, in terms of you know, ranking and percentile because you know, that, can be, that can be useful information. Now percentile does not mean anything if the entire class are here, okay? If I see a flat line, that's all here, I would say forget about the percentile. It's, it doesn't mean anything. But when the, when the graph looks like this, I would say percentile can be a useful information. Okay, all right. Yep. Are you going to grade like that for exam Yes. And the final exam as well. <laughs> all right, so we are moving on, okay, if, unless there are some additional questions or comments. I'm seeing none, okay. <clears throat> All right, so from time to time, I will talk about these topics. If you think this is a waste of the time, let me know, and I will refrain from making these, you know, kind of commentary stuff. <clears throat> All right, so what we are going to do today in the lab is more processing, more processor components, and we are gonna go back a little bit and talk about, oh, where is it? The clocked circuits right here. There we go. All right. So this one is kind of interesting because you know, I show you a circuit. It's best to look at the circuit first. So this is a circuit, and I'll explain what the components are in this particular circuit. We have a register here, okay? So the register is one of the things that we talked about before the break, okay? On the Thursday before the break, I finished the topic and basically talked about what a register is. Can someone remind me what is a register or what a register is? Go ahead. It's 
So it is a, basically it's a gang of D flip-flops. So it's a, basically it's a bunch of D flip-flops so that instead of remember, being able to remember a byte, a single bit, it can remember a byte in this case because it's A bit wide. Okay. So let's take a look at all the ports of a register. This port here is called the D port. Do we remember what is the D port in the context of a D flip-flop? Okay, data as output or input? As input, very good. This is Q, and what is port Q in the context of a D flip-flop? What is the Q port? Huh? What the memory has stored, but it's also serving as the output. That's the only output out of a D flip-flop. So in this case, the, the Q port of a register is the only output of a register, except it's not one single bit. In this case, it is a bit wide because of the A and B here. That's telling you the register is a bit wide. Okay, very good. This little thing here that has a triangle next to it is called a clock pin, which is also called the CLK pin when we talk about your D flip-flops. Does anyone remember what is the role of the clock pin in the case of a D flip-flop? Go ahead. Exactly. So it determines the timing of the update so that whatever is presented at the D port is remembered by the device and also being presented on the Q port at the same time. So the clock pin determines the timing. In the clocked D flip-flop that we talked about in class and I demonstrated it in Logisim, it is sensitive to a rising edge. In other words, when the clock pin sees you know, a zero to one transition, then at that moment, it remembers you know, what, is, uh, what is presented to the D port is now remembered by the, the D flip-flop. A register is basically a multi-bit D flip-flop, so it just remembers eight, eight bit at a time instead of one bit at a time. There's one more pin that we have, to, two more pins. This pin here is EN, so do you guys remember what EN stands for in the case of a D flip-flop? Enable, and what is the role of the enable pin? What does it do? Go ahead. Sort of. It's more like you know, whether the device should be paying attention or not. So when enable is a zero, the device doesn't care. Okay, you can have the clock going all you know, up and down all the time. You can have the data pin being changed all the time. But if the enable pin is off, the device simply does not pay any attention whatsoever to the clock pin nor the data pin. Okay, so very good. And we have one extra pin which is not connected to a normal input pin. This is a button, by the way. This is a momentary button, which means you, know, you have to click it to quote unquote turn it on. So it has a, a, a symbol of a zero. It corresponds to the reset pin of the D flip-flop discussion. What is the role of the reset pin or the reset port? Go ahead. Exactly, okay, and it, it's doing it asynchronously, which means it does not need the clock nor the enable to be working at all, okay? Every time this pin here, which is called the reset pin, is a one, the content of the register simply becomes zero. It does not rely on a rising edge clock. It does not rely on the enable being a one. It just gets the job done resetting the content of the register slash D flip flop. All right, very good. Okay, so now we have reconnected with the concepts that we have just talked about in the previous class, okay? That was a, a more than a week ago. This is an adder, okay? Um, so we are looking at this as an adder. It's adding the two inputs on the left-hand side to become the output on the right-hand side. This is the carry-in, which is our K0 in our discussion of binary addition. Uh, it, has, it also has a C out, carry out. This is an 8-bit adder. So C out is really corresponding to what? Which K? It's the overall carry of an 8-bit adder. So would that be K7 or K8? So 
So that would be K8, okay? So K8 is the to carry out you know, from this device, which does not go to anywhere because you know, we don't need it, okay? <clears throat> so now the question is, what does this circuit do and what can I control? Well, <clears throat> the first thing we want to do is to reset the register, so it starts with a zero. And then we want to turn on the enable, and that's it, okay? So that would set up the stage for how this circuit is supposed to work. And then what we do is simply, you know, using this clock signal here. Now, this pin does not look like a normal input pin because it can be automated. In other words, it can quote unquote auto clock. So, you know, it will just go up and down, you know, by itself over time. And that's why it has a kind of like a different symbol like this. So now the question is, when I have, when, when there's no rising edge here, what is the circuit doing? Let's look at the initial state. I click the reset button, the register becomes zero, zero. I enable this you know, register, which means you know, every time from here on, when I see the rising edge, the register will update itself based on port D, which is its input. Its output is initially zero. <clears throat> so it presents it to the output pin here so I can see it. But the output of zero also goes to one of the input of the adder. I'm adding zero to zero, which does not seem to make a lot of sense. But because K zero is a one, I'm effectively adding one to whatever the second input is. So this is basically just adding one to the input. It outputs a zero one in hexadecimal all the way here, and it goes back to the D pin of the register. It doesn't do a single thing because a register requires a rising edge on the clock in order to update. So as long as I don't have a rising edge at the clock pin, it doesn't do a single thing. But the moment I see a rising edge at the clock pin, then the register updates itself. The input of one would also become the state of the register, and it will start to output one right at that moment. So some of you may think, oh, then we have an infinite loop kind of problem because this one, is going back into the adder. The adder will, out, will now output 0, 2, and then 0, 2 comes back into here, and then it's going to output you know, 0, 2 here, then this would become uh, 0, 3, and so on. That is not the case. Why is that loop not happening? Yep, yep, exactly. That's why this is called a clocked circuit because you know, unless you are seeing a rising edge at the clock you know, pin here, the register just kind of stays put. So after it updates itself because of the rising edge, so the register is now outputting a one and the input is also a one, it just sits in that state forever unless you change the clock pin. Back to zero and then back to one. And then the second time it goes back to one, then the input of one, yeah, so the input of two is going to update the register. Go ahead. <clears throat> Which two pins? Uh, the left two pins are the input. The K8 is C out. It's uh, carry out. It is not connected to anything. All right, so now that we have a general idea of what this, what this circuit is going to do, we're going to play with it. This is something that I also encourage you guys to do on your own, okay? Because you know, <clears throat> listen to, link to me, listening to me to talk about this and you know, seeing how it works is one thing, but if you do this on your own, okay, in the process of doing this, you will get a better understanding of not only the concept that you're learning here, but also logic sim as well. So I'm just going to rebuild the circuit here. <clears throat> we go to arithmetic to pick up an adder right there, and then we go to memory to pick up a register, which is basically a multi-bit you know, default flop, but it's called the register. So now we have the two devices that we need. I have one output pin so that I can keep track of what is the output of the register. I mean, I don't really need the output pin because the register actually reflects its current state anyway. And then I need a bunch of input pins. 
So I need one input pin for the enable. <clears throat> I need a clock pin for the clock. So I go to wiring and then pick up a clock pin over here. There we go. This is why I like here the Logisim as a teaching tool because it really gives you the ability to interact with the circuit and you can make some changes to it and then interact you know, again. So this way you can get a better understanding of how things work. So we go to base, I think, you know, to get our, nope. We get to input output to get our button, there we go. So this button is a momentary switch, which means you, know, you have to click, you have to press on the mouse, mouse button in order to, for that thing to, to be a one. Otherwise the default is, is a zero. Uh, we have a problem here because the output pin is supposed to have the same width as the register, which is a bit. And then we take all this stuff here back to one of the two inputs on the left hand side of the adder. And then we go to the constant, get a zero. Constant, a bit wide, and we want that to be a zero, so we change that to zero, zero. And that becomes the second input to the adder. But we also want a constant of one to become the carry in. So once again, we get to constant. This time we have a one bit constant of one. And then we connect it to carry in. Okay, that's ugly, but it works. And then we just loop this thing around to become the input to the D port of the register. There we go. All right, so I know it doesn't seem to look exactly the same as the circuit that was shown in the notes, but functionally it is the same. So the way you work on this circuit is the first thing you do is to click the reset button, which is this button here. Um, when the circuit is first built, okay, it is it, the register starts with a default value of zero, zero. So typically you don't have to do it in simulation, but in the real device, you, you do have to do that. And then we turn on the enable, okay? This is just a one-time switch and we just turn it on. So now we can click on these pins and find out, you know, what this is already a one because zero plus one is a one and it's outputting a zero. So the register is not updating because it is lacking a rising edge. The moment you click on this pin here, it will alternate, it will basically do, it, it will alternate its state. So now we have a rising edge, and you can see how the register is now zero, 01. So when you look at the output of the register, it is zero, 01, okay, not very exciting. The input is actually zero, 02 at this point. But the register is not updating because we are not seeing a rising edge at the clock pin. So in order for the clock pin to see uh, and rising edge, we have to basically turn it back to uh, zero first, and then we click it again to, so that we can have a rising edge, and you can see how the register now becomes zero, one, and so on. So with this particular circuit, if you go to simulate and you go to uh, take frequency and choose something that is relatively low so it's visible, I would pick four hertz, okay? <clears throat> and then you go to simulate again, and this time you click on ticks enabled, it will automatically take like four times. So you will see, you will see four transitions per second, which means um, how often, often is the counter going to increment? There are four edges per second. So how frequently is the counter going to increment? Twice a second, very good, because the four transitions includes the falling edges as well but the register is only sensitive to rising edges. Very good. So we click on this, and now you can see, you know, basically the circuit, you're know, working all by itself. It's, it's basically a counter circuit. <clears throat> Do we have any questions about how this particular circuit works? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a constant input, so it's always a one. So imagine that you have your binary adder circuit where K0 is always a one. So it's always adding one when it's getting a 
Yes. Yep, that is correct. Question? I could have done it, you know, flip, the, flip it and do it the other way. So let me show you how, you know, we can kind of change the circuit a little bit. <clears throat> so instead of having a one over here, I can turn this into a zero. And then I turn this into a zero one. That will work as well. So uh, the, this particular circuit works exactly the same way as the other one. So there you go. Very good. Yep, go ahead. Well, let's do that because you know nothing is going to blow up, right? You know this is all simulation. So the moment you hit this switch here, no matter you know, what the clock is doing, no matter what the input is doing, whether it's enabled or not, it is going to change the register back to zero zero. Click. Mm, it depends on what you mean by interfering. The the reset event is called what we call asynchronous, which means it, it does not need the enable nor the rising edge to be coinciding with the reset being a one. As soon as the reset button is a one, the register content becomes zero zero again. All right, any other questions? So this is the most basic clocked circuit that I, that I can think of that is kind of interesting. It shows you certain things. Now, if you look at this circuit and go like, I remember seeing something like this already because some of you opened up the circuit for the circuit te the test, uh, the test driver circuit in week one and two. That's basically how that circuit works. Except it is, it was those were also connected to a ROM, where you know, it can grab the content and present the test input to the circuit that you built, and then you know, send the output you know, to the output pin so that you know, we, I can log the file and see you know wh whether your implementation is correct or not. So this is not the first time we see this circuit. But it's the first time that I explain the circuit. Yes, go ahead. Say that one more time. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, I see what you mean. Okay, so the answer is yes. Because what you're talking about is building a second adder, but using the C out of the first adder as the clock of the second stage adder. So you can do that, but it's but it's going to be um, because the because the register is only sensitive to rising edge, so you're only counting one half of what you should be counting. Because you know, once you have a one coming out of this, you'll know, see out, then you have one transition, but the falling edge is not going to trigger the register to change unless you program your register to do that to do that. So when you look at the clock. Uh, of the register, it is somewhat configurable. So when I look at the uh, register here, you can see how the trigger has options. So you can make it trigger on a rising edge, you can make it trigger on a falling edge. I'm not really sure exactly what high level and low level mean because I think that's the same as an enable, but you cannot do both rising edge and falling edge at the same time. So you'll be counting one half of what you should be counting in that case. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, you just click on the uh, constant and then type it in. So you have to make sure that you're in the select tool. You click on the constant and then you go to the value of the constant, you just you know, type type it over, you know. Yep. 
Yeah, because it's an A bit thing, and this is zero X something, so it, you can have up to two digits to specify you know, the value. Now, since I made the changes here, if you wanted to count by three, like incrementing by three every single time, all you have to do is to change this constant that is being selected to three, then it's gonna be counting by three. So it's kind of, yeah, I mean, not particularly useful, but now it's counting by three. If you wanted to count by five, you know, you can do that. So are we, are we good so far? Okay. Now, counters seems like a really simple, you know, kind of device, but it's actually really useful in many types of circuitry um, because timer provides a, uh, a timing basis for your operating system. There are many things in the operating system that requires a sense of time. Um, there's multi-threading, okay, that requires a sense of time because you know, your multiple threads you know, can, can have loops and busy things to do. So the processor or the operating system, the kernel of your operating system needs to say, okay, I'm going to divide up your know, processor resources evenly. Each thread gets to execute up to five milliseconds. Five milliseconds later, I'm gonna take control away from this thread and give it to the next thread and so on. So the timing basis of, a, of an operating system is really important and the most basic mechanism to provide that timing basis is called a timer. What is a timer? It's basically a counter except it counts down. When it gets to zero, it generates an event and then the operating system would intercept the event and go like, oh, okay, X many microseconds have you know, passed or whatever unit of time you know, that is the most basic measure, measurement of time has passed. Yes, go ahead. Yes. So if you put together a new computer, <clears throat> you will find that different devices have different quote unquote clock rates, right? So your RAM is rated at, you know, I don't know, what is the usual RAM these days? What is the quote unquote clock rate of, of RAM? 4,000 cannot possibly, 4,000 megahertz? No, the base cl clock cannot be 4,000 hertz. I think they're, they're still measured in hundreds of megahertz and not gigahertz. Okay, let's, let, let's, let's go shop for RAM. <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of fun stuff to do, right? So DDR um, on the most, on the modern motherboard you know, is a DDR4? Or five? Five? Okay, DDR5 and DIMM dual inline memory module. Man, that's cheap. I'm not kidding you. you know, 64 gigs of RAM you know, used to be a lot more expensive than that. So, okay, let's, let's figure out what these numbers are, okay? 4800 MT S. What does it mean? Exactly, millions of transfers per second. So every second, you are going to have 4.8 billion transfers of data from RAM. But that is not based on the clock, okay? So the clock, okay, so first of all, what, what do you think DDR stands for? Dubious doctor? I can keep going with those names. Sorry? No, not direct. Not dual. Close. You're getting close. Okay. What is the English word of dual? Double. Uh huh. Okay. And then double what? What is, what is the D pin of the um, data? And what do you think R is? No, rate, double data rate, okay? Double data rate is DDR. <clears throat> so why do we have different types of DDR? Because you know, doubling is doubling. How can we have you know, like DDR4, DDR5, and so on? Because they're not just doubling. Some of these are quadrupling. Okay, so what is the whole idea of you know, uh, DDR? You can, for this, you can just look up your know, Wikipedia too. So if you go to Wikipedia, and just look up the term DDR. 
that too, you know, it has all of these, you know, but double data rate is right here. So if, if you look at this diagram, this is really kind of interesting. So this diagram, the first line is what you should know already, okay? It's called single data rate. Single data rate means, you know, whatever the device is, is going to update on the rising edge and only on the rising edge. That is single data rate. So we are familiar with that concept already. I certainly hope so, okay? So double data rate is basically saying, oh, let's also update on the falling edge, okay? That's double data rate. But what we see as double data rate is actually more than double data rate you know, these days. It's actually quadruple, you know, because you know, we are basically making four transfers per clock cycle, which means your actual clock, your system clock, is running quite a bit slower compared to 4.8 gigahertz. It's running at you know, 1.2 probably lower than that. I'm, I'm going to suspect the actual data, the actual system clock is only at running at four, 600 megahertz, but it's fitting a lot more transfer in between because the RAM and the processor, they have an agreement. It's like, okay, so when I count to zero, I'm going to send you data. And the data rate that we're going to use is going to be four times the clock. So for every single rising edge and then falling edge time period, I will give you four transfers or eight transfers and so on. That is how your memory is going to talk to your processor when it is in DDR mode or DQDR or whatever you know, mode. So sounds really great, right? Every time you switch to DDR mode, it's not transferring just one single piece of data because DDR is used to transfer in burst mode. So every single time you set it up, it's gonna transfer, I cannot remember the window, 512 bytes or one kilobyte or something like that, okay? It's gonna transfer like you know, a chunk of bytes because it takes time to set up DDR. Because you know, if you wanna set up the, the, the RAM on one side and then the processor on the other side for a burst mode transfer, you have to say, okay, where do we start? Uh, what is the agreed you know, data rate, and so on and so forth. So it takes time to set it up. Once it is set up, then it will do the burst mode transfer into the cache of your processor. So that's why you know, modern processors have uh, at least three levels of cache, because you know, the level three you know, is usually what we care about or what the spec usually would tell you. That is usually the, we have the most number of locations in terms of um, level three cache. And in level two cache, we have less of those, but it's closer to the processor core. And then level one cache is right next to the core, which means it's super high speed to access, but you don't get as much of those. So all of these are ways to basically minimize the amount of time for your processor to get to memory content. So you might want to know, what if this technology does not exist? How long would it take to, to have one single transfer? So how do we know that? Okay, when you buy RAM, it will typically tell you about the latency. That's what the latency is about. So let me see if, whether there is a latency specification. Amazon probably does not even mention that, but some of the other websites usually report latency. I'm just going to leave, work for the, look for the word latency. There's always latency. The only question is how much. Okay, so 40. And each of these terms have a special meaning, like CAS has a meaning. So if you look up your know, DDR, CAS, you know, it will tell you what it is. So CAS is a column address strobe latency, which has to do with you know, how dynamic, how the way that dynamic RAM operates. So um, the RAM that we use is called DRAM. It's called DRAM, the D stands for dynamic, which means you know, it needs refresh, you know, column and row, okay? And you know, CAS is basically the column refresh rate. 
uh, it's one of the parameters that can determine you know, how quickly you can read and update your RAM. So the modern RAM is actually a lot more complicated than you know, what we're going to talk about in this class. So I, I know I digressed a little bit, but I think it is a worthwhile digression because it went all the way back to single data rate, which is what we have already talked about when we talked about D flip-flops. Yes? Nope, not even. Because it, okay, so this is a very good question too, and we can segue into the discussion of RAM, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at what RAM looks like. So I'm gonna add a new circuit here, and we'll just use it to test your uh, RAM circuit, which is also something that you're gonna have to do today. So the lab today, you're gonna need uh, Logisim. If you're using the lab computer, you, you need to re-download your Logisim unless you have it on there thumb drive or something like that. All right, so we go to memory, and then we pick out a RAM, like so, okay? Well, first thing first, what does RAM stand for? This is not a car commercial. Random access memory, very good. So it's called random access memory for a really strange reason, because we can update it, okay? We can update any location that we want to update. It's called, that's why it's called random access. So it has a few ports, okay? It has an A port. It has a select port, which is kind of the enable, the EN. It has a clock, which is kind of the same as a clock. It has a data port, okay? So the data port in this case is dual purpose. The data port is acting as the Q as well as the D of a D flip-flop port in terms of you know, what the D flip-flop has. In other words, you can either write to RAM or you can read from RAM, but not both at the same time, okay? So I'm gonna say that one more time. RAM is different from D flip flops or registers in the sense that you can either write to it or you can read from it, but you cannot do both at the same time. With a register, you can update it and at the same time, you'll get its output at the same time because it has two different ports one for update and one for the output. But RAM only has one single port when it comes to the data, so you can either use it to update the content in RAM or you can use it to extract the content already stored in RAM. So that's one major difference. Uh, this clear pin here is kind of the reset pin. If it is a one, then the entire content of this RAM is gonna be zero. Okay, so there are a few ports that are kind of similar to what we have seen already in a D flip flop, and then there are a few ports that are kind of like, hmm, those are extra. We haven't seen those before. This is also new. This is the LD port. This actually tells the RAM whether we are trying to overwrite a location in RAM or whether we are trying to read a location in RAM. So load LD is direction control. Are we reading or are we writing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Say that one more time. Okay, so that is not even a command that RAM understands. RAM only, only understands, do you want me to read from a location or do you want me to update a location? So let, let me convert this into C syntax, you know, then it will be really kind of clear what we are talking about. So let me get to um, mouse pad. So I'm gonna show this on the side right here. So there are two things you can do with RAM. You can say I'm reading, which means the D port is dereferencing whatever the address port is indicating. Or you can also do a write mode, which is the opposite here. So this is reading, oh, yes, this is reading from RAM, and this is writing to RAM. Okay, so I'm just going to take a pause here because I am almost 100% certain that some people may look at these two statements and go like, I have no idea what that is. 
This is why we have CISB 360. What does the uni, unary operator asterisk, what does it mean in C++ or C? What is at the expression to the right-hand side of the asterisk? Very good. Okay, so the first line is basically saying the address port tells you where in RAM we want to access. Whatever is the content at that location will be presented to the D port. So that's a read operation. This occurs when the LD is a 1. The second one is overwriting a location. The LD port has to be a zero in this case. So in this case, we take whatever is presented to the D port and use it to update whatever the A port is pointing to within the RAM component. So I know some people are now saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. What do you mean by the content or locations inside the RAM? Right click on the RAM component go to edit content, and that will help visualize the content inside the RAM. So when you look at the content inside the RAM, it gives you this table here, which can be initially confusing because it's just a bunch of digits. The leftmost column you can see is slightly italic. That is giving you the address of the first byte or the leftmost byte of that row. In other words, if I point to Eh, I just want to point to this by this location here. Let's try to figure out what this location is. So the first thing you do is to figure out what is the location of the leftmost location on this entire row. It is six zero. So if this is six zero, then we have to count all the way up to here. Six one, six two, six three, six four, six five. This is location six six. Is that okay? The number of locations inside RAM is determined by the number of bits that we assign to the address port. In this case, the address port width is 8. Now, by the way, the port, uh, the address bit width and the data bit width, they don't have to be the same. One can be 11, the other one can be 5, okay? So one determines how many locations we have in the RAM, the other one determines how many bits is at one location. Okay, I'm just going to pause and see if there are any questions. Yes? Yes, you can. So you can, okay, I can give you some really kind of weird example. So you can have like four bits for the address which means you know, how many locations do I have? If the address port only has four bits, what is the number of locations that I can differentiate based on only four bits? This is going all the way back to base conversion. Sorry? No. Okay, I have four bits to specify location, which means bit zero can be a zero or one, Bit 1 can be a 0 or 1, bit 2 can be a 0 or 1, and then bit 3 can also be a 0 or 1. How many locations can I differentiate based on 4 bits? No. Okay, did I, did I mention this is going back to base conversion? 2 to the power of 4, and that would be 16. Okay, so it can differentiate 16 locations. So let's go ahead and do this. Okay, so let's find out what's going to happen here. And you can see how the content of the RAM is now on a single row. And one row has exactly 16 locations. Okay, okay, you don't believe me? We will do some counting here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And each location has two hexadecimal digits because each location is at least at this point, a bit wide, okay? Each hexadecimal digit can represent up to four bits. So with eight bits, I just need two hexadecimal digits. 
Is that making any sense? So, but I promise you guys that I would do something weird, right? You know, eight bit per location is not weird at all. It's called a byte. So let's do a byte and a half, okay? A byte and a nibble. That actually is a word. A nibble is four bits. So now we have four bits for the address, you know, which means we still have only 16 locations, but each location now has 12 bits. 12 bits require three hexadecimal digits to represent because each hexadecimal digit represents four bits. So that's why you can see three, zero, three digits is for one location, three digits for one location, and so on. Is that okay so far? All right, okay. <clears throat> so now we're gonna do something with this particular RAM component, okay? So I typically don't do something strange with, you know, like this kind of circuit, but that's okay. We can always, you know, do strange. So we have, you know, this input pin connected to the address port. And then we have one enable pin connected to the select. So select is basically, it's called chip select, by the way. The full name of SEL is chip select, or usually it's abbreviated to CS, you know, when you look at the circuit diagram. It is basically the same thing as quote unquote enable. Okay, if it is not, if the chip is not enabled, it's ignoring the traffic of all of the other ports. So in order to do something with a particular RAM component, you have to select it first. And then we have the typical clock pin. I'm just gonna use an input pin instead of the actual clock pin for the clock port over here. <clears throat> and then we have LD, which is direction control. Are we reading or writing? Okay, there we go. Mm, the clear, I'm gonna, I, I will have one pin for the clear too, just so that we can see to how we clear the content. The data port is going to be the funny one, okay? So I'm gonna use an output pin for now, just an output pin that is 12 bit wide because I changed the width of the data to 12 bit. So it's kind of weird because you know, it wants to do a stack you know, representation. Okay, so with the circuit done like this, okay, I can only be reading from a location. I cannot be writing to a location. So you go like, but every location is a zero, 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 so it's not going to be a whole lot of interest. It's not going to be interesting. You are correct. So let's go ahead and change one location to not zero, zero. So I will change this location, which is location what? What is the actual location of what I have selected here? It is not location 12 because there's no 12 in base 16. You got the right idea, okay? But it's not called 12. C, okay, location C, that is correct. Because this is location eight, location nine, location, nope, okay, this is location B, okay? Because eight, nine, A, and then B. This is location B in hexadecimal, which is, which is equivalent to 11 in base 10, okay? So I'm gonna change this to, you know, 76, okay, for some reason, okay, there we go. So I want to read this location. How do I read this location? The first thing that I need to do is to, um, the order is not important at this point, okay? Um, I have to use the address port to specify location B. So can someone tell me what is the binary representation of hexadecimal B, which is 11, which is eight plus four plus, no, eight plus two plus one. One, zero, one, one, very good. So now we specify one, zero, one, one, which is hexadecimal B, you know, to specify the location that I want to read over here. Um, can someone tell me what LD should be? I'm trying to read a location in RAM, I'm not trying to overwrite it. Should be a one, okay, so we configure that to be a one. So it is important to configure everything first before you enable the chip, okay? Because you know, if you don't do that, okay, then it is possible that you might have misconfigured one of the input ports, and then you end up doing something that you don't intend to do. So that's why it is important to set up all of these things first, okay? And then you go like, okay, 
Did I have this setup? Yep. Did I have this setup? Yep. Okay. Now we can enable the chip to read that sing one single location. So I put a one into the select port here, and then the output is exactly what we're expecting. <clears throat> zero one 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 is a seven. One one zero one is a D. Zero one one zero is a six. So we are now looking. We are reading the content at the location that the A port is specifying. So you go first, and then you go. Go ahead. Because a reading from RAM does not need a clock. The clock controls the timing of the update. I'm not updating anything. So that's why it does not depend on the clock. Go ahead. Same. OK, all right. So when you're reading, the clock really does not play any part in this. Okay. So in reality, if you're dealing with DRAM, okay, when you're dealing with the actual RAM module that you buy for your computer, this takes a very significant, significant amount of time. So from the time that the processor specifies on the bus, okay, what location it wants to access, and this is a read operation, and to the time that the RAM component goes like, okay, let me go look up that location and hook it up to the output, it actually takes a very significant amount of time. There's a huge latency. So without any additional circuits to help, your processor will need to insert what we call wait states into the processing cycle to wait for RAM to be ready to present your whatever content is at the location that you want to access. In other words, you have to artificially slow down the processor in order to wait for memory to present the data that you want to read. Yep. Um, that 40 is the CAS, or the column address you know, uh, refresh. So there's a different you know, uh, latency for reading for this type of latency. I cannot remember the name, but I think we can go find out. DDR read latency. <clears throat> so it's a timing parameter that measures the delay between the memory controller sending a command to read data, which so I'm, I'm acting as a memory controller you know, by controlling the address port and also the LD port to read data from a specific column in the mo memory module and the module responding with the requested data. So let me see if there's a specific, you know, um, so read latency is CAS latency times 2,000 divided by data rate. So it's really slow, typically. You can also read something else. There we go. Okay, so now we can actually you'll see some numbers here. Um, it says right here, so DDR4 3200 at CL22, it's 13.75 nanoseconds. You go like, oh, that's, that's a really small amount of time, right? It's just your know, 13. Point is it 13? Yep, 13.75 nanoseconds. Okay, so tell me again, what is the maximum clock rate of your main processor? If you buy anything that's even semi-decent these days, it's like 4.8, 4. Point something gigahertz, right? So how many clocks has gone by in 13.75 nanoseconds when you have a four gigahertz clock? Okay, come on, you guys can do this calculation, right? Three, okay. So that means you, know, you, you have to pause the execution of the processor for three instruction cycle in order to say, so one instruction is gonna say, I wanna read from that location. The memory controller, which is a part of the main processor, will do all the things you know, that I did you know, with the, uh, with, in Logisim. And then the main processor will be told to say, hold your horses, okay? Twiddle your thumb for, the, for three clocks in order for RAM to base, basically come back and go like, okay, I, I got what you want now, yes. It's, it's more, than, more than three, right? Yep. It's quite horrendous, okay? So that means <clears throat> if memory access is only based on these numbers, 
having that 4.8 gigahertz clock and you know, eight core you know, in the processor chip means absolutely nothing other than it helps to warm up your room. Because guess what? For the most part, your main processor is just gonna be twiddling its thumb. All eight processors, all eight cores will be twiddling their thumbs while waiting for data to come back. That's why we have DDR technology. This is why we have caching, because all of those things are designed to keep the processor cores busy. Without those technologies, your, your 4.8 your gigahertz your processor is totally useless. It's, it's pointless to go beyond even one gigahertz. Memory, it depends on what kind of processing you're doing, okay? So memory becomes a bottleneck, especially when your location access appears to be random. Now, <clears throat> depending on what program you're running, depending on the algorithm, and also how the code is arranged, if you can have locality, then you can maximize the use of caching, which means you, know, you only need to get back to memory once in a while because most of the work is done using level one, two, or three cache, which means you know, now you can basically keep the processor busy for the most part. Now, if you can keep everything that you want to process in the registers, it's even better because registers are not memory. They are a part of the processor core, so they can certainly keep up with all the, uh, what we call the... Um, the ALUs, the arithmetic and logic units, which is where the adder, the subtractor, the comparators, and multipliers, they are all located into what we call the ALU. And each core has multiple ALUs for integers and multiple ALUs for floating point numbers. <clears throat> they can all do calculations at the same time. In other words, when it comes down to the, the amount of processing your processor core can perform is massive. The question is, how do you make the most use of those resources? That becomes you know, a compiler issue because the scheduling of the instructions now becomes important. How do I, you know, because this data does not depend on the calculation over there, and so you can try to parallelize the you know, calculations as much as possible, and, but that depends on whether your compiler can figure out the dependency of all the calculations that needs to be done and try to maximize the use of the available processing units inside a single core. And then you have multiple cores, and then they, they're all trying to compete for cache resources and so on. So it's really complicated. You know, it's a very complicated, complicated topic if you want to make the most use of the available hardware in the processor. Um, some RAM module does have that, but the, the main problem is, okay, let's go back to the RAM component here. So the main problem has to do with the module itself can only do one thing at a time. In other words, it's, you imagine this is a server, okay, at a restaurant. It's, it's one single server. So that server can either take an order or, you know, take the dishes out you know, from the kitchen. Cannot do both at the same time. So it doesn't really um, make sense to have another port just for output and then one just for input because you cannot possibly use both at the same time. Now, if you do have both at the same time, then it increases the routing difficulty of your motherboard because we already have a lot of, okay, can anyone imagine the number of layers on a typical you know, motherboard that you purchase you know, from like Newegg or you know, some other place? Does everybody understand what I mean when I said the number of layers on the motherboard? Nope? Okay. So when you look at the motherboard, you, you see the traces, right? You see the lines you know, connecting from one component to another component, right? You see the copper. So in the good old days, we have single layer motherboards or single layer circuit boards, which means you know, only one side of that board has copper and then you can etch away you know, certain copper so that you, now you can specify this pin connects to that pin over there, this pin connects to that pin over there, single layer. 
Double layer is pretty easy, right? You know, you, with the same substrate or FR4 material, you have two layers of copper, one on top and one at the bottom. And then by, you know, selectively etching away things and using what we call uh, vias, okay? So, so you can bring a signal from the bottom layer to the top layer and so on. So it in, increases the amount of routing resources, which means, you know, you can have things connecting, you know, kind of randomly, and you can still figure out a way to draw that line from one side to the, from one pin to another pin. You quickly run out of resources, even with a two layer board, double layer board. So the new boards that we have, okay, you can actually look it up. <clears throat> so you can ask the question, the number of layers, circuit board layers, circuit board layers of a typical motherboard. Most motherboards use four layer circuit boards and they can go up to 10. So you basically have 10 insulating layers, okay, kind of sandwiched. And then between every layer is a conductive layer. So you can kind of imagine the uh, complexity of manufacturing those motherboards because you have to manufacture each layer separately so now you have your know, 10 of these things, right? And then you have to line up everything in a perfect way. And then you sandwich all 10 layers together. And then you put in these little copper tubes so selectively so that certain signals can go from layer one to layer five. And then some certain signals can go from layer zero to layer seven and so on. And the necessity to go to a 10 layer board has to do with the number of traces, the number of copper wires that we have to connect between the components. How many people have seen a processor? Like you know, when you purchase a processor, you just look at the back of the processor and look at the number of pins. How many pins do we have? Thousand, yes. How, how about the memory modules? How many people have hold up a memory module and, and count the number of pins on the DIMM, on the dual inline memory module, DIMM, D-I-M-M? -M. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, okay. And then you have other things too. You have your uh, chipset and so on and so forth, and also your PCI controller, okay? The PCI bus you know, itself takes up a lot of the lines as well. So now you have to imagine, how do I route these pins you know, from one to another and so on and so forth? That is the reason why you know, some of the motherboards have to go to 10 layer boards because the width of the data bus increases the number of connections from the processor to the, from the memory controller to the RAM modules. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting because you know, when you have a broken you know, layer, you know, Traces can be broken, okay? And this is why you, you don't want to flex your motherboard when you purchase it. So when you install your main processor on it, you know, you don't want to kind of like push it so hard that the whole circuit board flexes. Because the flexing of the circuit board can break a trace. And if that broken trace is between, is in one, in one of the inside layers, you cannot even tell. There's no way to test it. You just know that the circuit board does not work anymore. The traces are also very thin, okay? Um, we are talking about, you know, when I design circuit boards you know, for general purpose stuff, you know, eight mil is really kind of small. A mil is a thousandth of an inch. And that is now considered a pretty thick trace. Okay, so we, I, I'm thinking it's down to like two, maybe even less, you know. So two thousandths of an inch is the width of a trace on a circuit board. It doesn't take much to destroy it. If the flexing of the circuit board is gone. So anyway, I know I kind of digressed. I'll give you guys the passcode to the lab for today. Give me a second to get there. So I hope these topics are kind of interesting to at least you know, some of you. <clears throat> I mean, do people still put computers together, like getting all the components and putting your computer together? Okay, I'm, I'm glad that people are still doing it.
because there will come a day people will ask me, what do you mean by a circuit board? What do you mean by a motherboard? I just buy a computer from Safeway. All right, so this is your lab today. The uh, access code is TTP, which stands for Tax Toy Processor. It's, this is not it, okay? This is not my processor. You know, we'll get to it next time you know, in the next lab. <clears throat> and I will publish it so that you guys can do it. All right, I'll see you guys over at the lab. But you will need, you will need a logic sim to do this lab. So, you know, go ahead and fire up logic sim too.